it's on personal care. So personal care is something private, something that you do in private. Make sure that you're pulling the privacy curtain. You're using the bath blanket to cover your person to help prevent chilling, but also for privacy. You never want to undress anyone and then wheel them down the hall with no clothes on. You want to take the clothes with you to the bathroom or to the shower room and then undress them in the shower room and cover them with their bath blanket. You need to plan their day according to each patient's re uh, preference. So their likes and dislikes are incorporated in their personal care. If they refuse personal care, then you just need to document on the um, CNA sheet that they refuse to have a bath at that time or on your shift. And then you're going to pass that along to the next shift to see if maybe they were going to follow up and get a bath on the next shift. But the reason that we bathe people is it's not just because we have to have a bath every day, but it helps to remove dirt and perspiration and microorganisms. It eliminates odors. If they have an overgrowth of microorganisms on their skin, when they get a cut, it's more likely to get infected. So we need to make sure that we're keeping our skin clean. And most residents in the facilities, they don't get a bath every single day. If they want a bath every day, they can have a bath every day. A lot of times they just call it a little bird bath where they just put a bucket of basin of water in front of them and they wash their important parts like a partial bed bath that we'll talk about in a little bit. But to actually get in the shower or get in the tub every single day, a lot of people don't do that. They have a bath schedule and they're on the schedule for Monday, Wednesday, Friday or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. That doesn't mean people don't get showers and baths on Sundays. They're just not scheduled for one. So if they're on the schedule three days a week, you have to make sure you're offering it to them. And if they refuse it, you have to report it to the nurse and chart it on your charting. At some point during the week, they have to get a bath to help remove the microorganisms from their skin. Baths also help with increasing circulation. They provide mild exercise and it makes the resident feel better overall and feel more comfortable. They may not want to get into the shower, but once they're done with the shower, they feel a lot better. So bathing is important. It's usually done as part of AM care, but we can also do it as part of PM care according to their preference. Some people take showers in the morning. Some people want to take a shower before they go to sleep at night. Plan ahead. Always make sure you bring all of your supplies with you. So look through your supply list that we gave you. Make sure you gather everything that you need to take to the shower room with you. You don't want to leave the resident in the shower room to go back to their room to get their supplies. Everybody has their own set of personal supplies. So they have their own shampoo, their own soap, their own hairbrush, their own toothbrush. Um, that should be labeled with their last name and kept in the top drawer of their bedside table. If you have um, community supplies in the shower, like a five gallon bucket of shampoo, it has to stay locked up. It can't just be left out in the shower room. So any kind of um, liquids or shampoos, hand wash, things like that need to be in a locked cabinet in the shower room. So after you've gotten all your supplies ready, then you're going to get your resident. Cover them with their bath blanket. If we're going to do a bed bath, um, sometimes you're not going to take them to the shower room. You're just going to do a bed bath in their room. We're going to go through doing the bed bath. We're going to do a partial bed bath for the skills. But you need to make sure you're using that bath blanket to cover them up, to provide for privacy, and also to prevent chilling. With the bed bath, you start with the eyes. You're using water only with no soap and then you proceed to wash their face. Some people want to use soap on their face. Some people use a special face cleaner. Some people use a special toner. So whatever they clean their face with or just a plain washcloth with warm water on their face. Once you've cleaned their eyes and their face, then you need to dry their eyes and their face. So make sure you pat it dry after you've cleaned it. Um, then go on to their ears, their neck, their arms, their underarms. While you're going through the bed bath, you're putting a towel underneath the area that you're cleaning to try to protect the bed from getting wet, but also you're going to use that towel to dry off that area as soon as you've washed it and rinsed it. So you wash it, rinse it, and dry it, and then move on to the next part. 
you need to do their chest, their abdomens, their legs, their feet, turn them on their side, get their buttocks, um, give them a back rub, and then peri care is done last. So when you're doing a bed bath, you go from the cleanest area to the dirtiest area. When you're doing their arm, you start at the top of their arm and go circular motion around all the way down their hand, down their fingertips, and then you lift up their arm and go back for the underarm because the underarm is the dirtiest area of the arm. Clean the rest of their body off, dry it off as you're going through each individual part of their arm, their chest, their legs, their back, and then peri care will be done last. We're also going to go over peri care as a separate step. If you're helping someone to a bedpan or changing their briefs, you do peri care regardless of whether you're giving a full bed bath or not. When you're doing the bed bath, you change the water as needed. So if the water should get dirty or if the water gets cold, you change the water in your basin. The water in your basin is clean rinse water. It does not have soap in it and you don't rinse your washcloth out in that water and make it dirty. You're only using it for dry washcloths to get them wet, wring them out so you're not dripping water all over the place. And on some of the washcloths, you're going to put a soap, a little bit of soap, and then you're going to use a clean washcloth, clean dry washcloth, get it wet, wring it out, and use that to rinse them off. Don't put too much soap on your washcloths because what you put on, you need to get off or you're going to cause them to have some kind of contact dermatitis. So you don't want to have them have excess soap left on their skin because that's going to make them itchy or sticky or cause some kind of rash. Um, when you're testing the water, you're going to set your base in the, in the sink. You're going to turn on the hot water, turn on the cold water, and get it a good temperature. Test it with your wrist before you have the resident test it. Have them put their hand in the water to test it and make sure it's fine for them. And then there's the part about don't using too much soap because what you put on, you're going to need to get off. And you're always applying soap to a wet washcloth. You're never putting the soap inside the bucket of water. The soap goes on a wet washcloth. Use a circular motion when you're bathing from the cleanest area to the dirtiest area. It's a good time to communicate with your residents, talk with them, make them feel comfortable, let them know what you're doing. Also, let them do as much as they can do for themselves. If they can wash their arms and they can wash their chest, let them do that. Help them with getting the washcloth, with the, getting the soap, giving a new washcloth, but let them clean off as much of their body as they can. Even with their peri area, if they can wipe, let them wipe as long as they're wiping from front to back. You're also observing people for abnormalities and you're going to report to the nurse if there are any abnormalities seen. So if you notice any redness on their skin, if you see any skin tears, if you notice they have a rash, don't touch it without gloves on. When you're bathing people or doing a water skill, you have your gloves on, okay? You're going to be touching mucous membranes. You may come in contact with non-intact skin, but you need to make sure you have your gloves on. So this is the video that's going to tell you how to do a complete bed bath from head to toe. So that video is going to walk you through starting like what supplies that you need and everything, but we're going to skip on through that. We'll watch that a little bit later. But when we were doing for national testing is we're going to do, you're going to watch me actually do a partial modified bed bath. Okay. So the partial bed bath is just going to be washing your face, washing your hands, washing your underarms, your back, your buttocks, and your genitals. It's just the dirty areas. Um, like I said, some people call that a, a bird bath. But let the resident watch as, wash as much as they can for themselves. And then we'll watch the video on me doing the modified partial bed bath. With the tub baths. So if you have a tub, some facilities have them, some facilities don't. But it, some facilities have whirlpool tubs where it helps the residents who have skin conditions. Um, but the tub, the water has to be less than 106 degrees, just like a shower. So it's 105 degrees. If there's no thermometer, you test it with your wrist to make sure it's comfortable for you. 
provide your privacy, and you're not allowed to leave the resident alone in the tub or the shower. You have to, um, some tubs are completely enclosed, and you're going to use this special lift. So this is what their lift looks like here. You would put them in this lift in a sling, just like the Horia lift, lift them up and set them down inside the tub. This is what a shower chair looks like here if you're going to use the shower chair and put them into the shower. With the tubs, they have a hot water and a cold water. The hot water is on the left hand side, the cold water is on the right hand side. Whenever you're using a tub or shower, if there's more than one handle, if it's hot water on the left, cold water on the right, you always turn off the hot water first because you don't want to burn them with the hot water. If you just have one handle, and if you think about when you're in your shower and you have one handle, it starts at cold and the more you turn it to the left, the hotter the water gets. So when you're turning it off, you're turning it to the right, and it's going from hot to cold. So you're always turning off that hot water first. Tubs, tub baths, and showers should last less than 20 minutes. If your resident starts to feel weak or dizzy or feels like they're going to pass out or in there in the bath or the shower, you need to turn the water off, get them out of the bathtub, get them dried up, covered with a bath blanket, and have them rest, and then let the nurse know. Okay. But nobody should be left alone in a shower or in a tub. All right. Your Whirlpool bathtubs, sometimes they use them for therapeutic reasons if people have skin breakdown. This is an example right here of the sit to stand lift that we're going to work with in clinical. But this is just help people need to get um, from a sitting position up to a standing position. They can stand up on their own. That's why their feet are on the platform. Their shins or knees are pushed up against this black area here. And the, the, the strap just goes around their back and around their waist. And it just pulls them up into a sitting or standing position from a seated position. But you can see this tub has a door that goes upwards. So once you get them in, you just close the door down and then you can fill up the tub. This one has a hot water and a cold water spigot. So make sure you're always turning that hot water off first. When your residents are in the shower, this is a shower chair. It looks just like a potty chair, but you make sure you put the bucket underneath it in case your resident goes to the restroom while they're in the shower. If they have warm water running down them, they may have an accident. Um, but you always have the bucket underneath the shower chair platform. If they do have a bowel movement or urinate in the shower, you need to clean it up. Housekeeping does not clean up bodily fluids. If they have a bodily accident in the bath, in the shower, you're going to be the one cleaning them up. So make sure you take them to the restroom, have them sit on the toilet before you put them in the shower. The showers have the little pull-down shower spigots so you can get the water close to them. They also have grab bars in them. And then here on the wall, sometimes they do have some shampoo or soaps on the wall for you. Just like in the gym, there's a, each little shower stall has a shower curtain. You need to make sure you're pulling that shower curtain closed to provide for privacy. Remember to toilet them before the shower and never leave them in the, alone in the, to, in the tub or the shower. Okay. And we will practice doing showers at clinical. Your shampooing and combing. Shampooing for some residents, they only do it once a week, but it's done at least once a week. Either you're going to shampoo their hair or they're going to go to the beauty shop and the beauty shop, their families pay extra for them to get their hair done at the beauty shop. So if your resident gets their hair done at the beauty shop, make sure you don't wash their hair and wash out their curls or brush out their curls. If they just went to the beauty shop, you need to be asking and making sure before you try to wash their hair as well. But it has to be done at least once a week. And when you're shampooing someone's hair, you're using your fingertips, not your fingernails. So you're not digging your hands into their scalp and, and scratching their scalp with your fingernails. Make sure you're gentle and make sure you're just using your fingertips. When you are shampooing someone's hair, you're supposed to be observing for lice or nits. They're like little bugs. Everybody's seen lice before or little eggs in people's hair. It's very communicable. It happens if one person gets it, it spreads very easily to other people. 
But look for those lice or nits or sores. There's a pressure spot in the back of their head, and if they lay too long on the back of their head, they could get a pressure sore or pressure ulcer. You also, scabies a lot of times gets in people's scalps. So if you notice anything where there's sores or there's nits or there's lice or the hair's falling out excessively, let your nurse know. When you're styling hair, you need to style it in an age-appropriate style. If the person wants you to braid their hair, you can braid it if you know how, or you can ask someone else. If they have long hair, a lot of times they like it braided or pulled up. So help them style their hair in the appropriate style, and we'll talk about um, styling and brushing hair. When you're brushing their hair, doing their hair care, you're supposed to be holding your hand on their scalp and then brushing downwards so that you're not just yanking their hair out of their head. Um, when you're shampoo, when you're blow drying their hair, you're holding the blow dryer at least six to eight inches away from their head and pointing it at their hair, not at their scalp. So think about the same way when you do your own hair, you don't want to burn your scalp with a blow dryer. Um, a lot of places, you're not allowed to use the blow dryer in the shower room. You have to take it out and do it in the hallway or take them back to their room and blow dry their hair in their room. So don't use the hair dryer near anybody with oxygen because the hair dryer could spark electricity and the oxygen can catch on fire. And also don't use the hair dryer near water because the electricity and the water you're not allowed to have. But if you are blow drying their hair, just use it the same way you do yourself. Put it on a low setting, hold it six to eight inches away from their scalp, and blow dry their hair. Use a hair brush and pull it out and blow dry it that way. Uh, and we'll practice hair care on Susie. Your oral hygiene. This is done at least twice a day. Your abbreviation for twice a day is BID. BID is twice a day. That means in the morning and in the evening. Some people brush their teeth after every meal, so at least twice a day. Encourage the resident to do their own teeth if possible, but if we do not take care of our oral hygiene or our routine dental care, then they're going to get cavities, they're going to get bleeding gums, they're going to have all of this rot, mouth rot, um, sores, loose teeth. If you see a resident who's having difficulty with their gums or with their mouth or they're having trouble chewing because their teeth are loose or their teeth are chipped, you need to let the nurse know so that we can have the dentist come and check on them. They do get dental care, but routine dental care is the CNA's responsibility. Routine dental care means what you do for your teeth every day. And every day you should be brushing your teeth and flossing your teeth. So your residents need to be doing the same thing. Even the residents that don't have their natural teeth, if they have dentures, we're gonna learn about doing denture care, but you still need to be massaging their gums and cleaning their gums with these little, um, these little oral swabs. So they come in little packages. They're just little sponges on the end of a stick. You get it wet, squeeze it out a little bit against the edge of the cup so you don't have too much excess water and then massage their gums with it. Okay. If you notice that somebody is, their teeth or their gums are hurting them, then let us know. You're supposed to be, when you're brushing someone's teeth, you're actually holding the brush at a 45 degree angle to the gum line and you are brushing the gums as well as the teeth. You're not just brushing the teeth. You're doing circular motions, brushing the gums and the teeth from one side to the other side. And we're gonna practice that. Your bristles are always pointing down and you need to make sure you're brushing the tongue. All right. Flossing your teeth. Make sure you're putting on your gloves. You can put on gloves when you're um, brushing their teeth as well, but you're gonna floss their teeth. You need to break off an 18 inch piece of floss from the dispenser, hold it between your middle fingers on each hand, and then wrap it around one finger. Just like you do for yourself at home, you wrap the 18 inches on one finger, and then you have the other finger that is on the other side that as you move to a different area, you're gonna wrap it around the other finger to use a different area of the floss. When you stretch the, the floss on, on your thumbs, so you have it between your middle fingers and then you're gonna stretch it on your thumbs. When it's on your thumbs, you are doing their top teeth. 
So you're going up and down. You're not sawing back and forth in between their teeth when you're flossing. You go up and down, and then you spin it around your finger to get another piece, and then go up and down. Okay. When you are using it with your index fingers, so you still have the floss wrapped around your middle fingers here, and then you're using your index finger, you're going up and down on their bottom teeth. Okay, so start at the back tooth and come around and using a different area of the floss each time. But don't saw back and forth, just go up and down in between the teeth and you're done. Uh, this just says moving it up and down from the top from the top of the crown to the gum line and then back up and then move on to a new section of floss every time in between each two. And there it is with the flossing the lower teeth with your index finger on it. So you can see their index finger. Move it up and down motions, start at the right, work yourself around. Okay. This is the video for mouth care. We're going to watch that. Um, watching me do mouth care on someone. So just make sure that you know routine dental care is the CNA's responsibility. You have to help people, encourage people, make sure they are brushing their teeth, make sure they have access to a toothbrush, toothpaste, denture care um, things. Um, the next little slideshow we'll see if your person is unconscious you still need to do mouth care, but instead of doing it BID, you have to do it every two hours. If your resident is NPO or unconscious or comatose, you use these swabs, dip them in the water, wring out the excess on the side of your cup, and swab their mouth out and their tongue at least every two hours. People with really dry mouths tend to get more cavities because the saliva in your mouth actually keeps the bacteria from growing on your teeth. But if you don't have any saliva or if you have a really dry mouth because you're NPO or you're a mouth breather or your mouth is wide open, then you're going to have difficulties with tooth decay and um, a foul smelling mouth. Um, as far as brushing your teeth too, make sure you're brushing their tongue. So we're going to practice on brushing the tongues too. And you just stick your tongue out, start at the back and come down. Okay, don't gag them with the toothbrush, but stick it in and come straight down and then do it like two or three times on their tongue. There's a lot of odor that stays on our tongue if we're not brushing our tongue. And we'll practice doing that oral hygiene and the brushing. Now with your dentures, dentures are still cleaned at least twice a day, just like regular teeth. Wear your gloves when you're helping people get their dentures out. You are going to put some gloves on, hold your hand like this, and use your thumb and fingers. Get a paper towel or a washcloth or something because the teeth have a lot of saliva on them. And then stick your hand in and grab it with your thumb and fingers and pull it out. Sometimes you're going to have to pull it and twist it to get it out of their mouth. People do use adhesive tape and adhesive powder to keep their dentures stuck up into their gums really good, but just wiggle it a little bit and it'll loosen and then you can help them pull it out. Or have them pull their own dentures out and have a kidney basin lined with a paper towel and tell them to put the, the dentures inside the kidney basin for you. Okay? Dentures are very expensive so you need to make sure you're handling them with care. but you are still going to be cleaning them at least twice a day. So if you are working night shift, then you're going to be cleaning them before they go to bed. If you're working day shift, you're going to be cleaning them when they wake up in the morning. A lot of people like to just put their dentures in a denture cup labeled with their name on it and put these little tablets in there, the effortants and things, which are great because they clean the germs and they disinfect the dentures. You just need to make sure that you are rinsing the dentures whenever you take them out of the cup because that chemical could still be on the dentures. It fizzes and turns the water blue for about 15 or 20 minutes, but then it turns clear and you don't even know that it's in there. We also don't store those effortant things in their um, bedside table because some people think that they are sweet tarts or they think that they're candy. So those kind of denture tablets need to be locked up somewhere in a locked cabinet. Um, 
So we're going to remove our dentures. We're going to handle them carefully. If they are uh, damaged or cracked or if the residence is not fitting properly, again, let the nurse know so that we can get the dentist to look at them for emergency dental care. Dentists do emergency dental care, but they also come to the facility once a month and they check on people who have their dentures, as long as they're on the list to be checked on. So we need to know so we can put them on the list to be seen by the dentist. Um, when you're using the dentures, you're, you're using either cold or tepid water. Tepid means warm, but don't use the hot water because the hot water can damage your dentures. And you're always storing them in your container with water. If um, you let the water run out, then the dentures are going to warp. It's just like always constantly having saliva in your mouth. It keeps the dentures the right size, the right shape. But if you just let them dry out, they're made of a material that it's going to start warping and then they're not going to fit in the person's mouth correctly. So we are going to work on denture care and we'll watch the video on me actually doing denture care for Susie. Uh, the rest of your mouth care, like I just said about your comatose, unconscious, unresponsive person, is at least every two hours, if not more often. Your mouth breathers who have very dry mouths and no mucus. Your NPO person who can't have anything to eat or drink by mouth. All of them need this routine, frequent, every two hours, swab them out with a swab. Tilt their head to one side to prevent them from aspirating and then make sure you're using some kind of swab. If you don't have these little sponges on a stick, you can just put a piece of gauze on a wooden stick and get it wet and then rinse their mouth out with it. As long as you're getting their mouth a little bit wet on the inside along their gum lines every two hours. You can put lubricant on their lips, but remember if they're wearing oxygen, you're not putting on petroleum jelly. You have to use some kind of non-petroleum lip gloss or lip lubricant if they have oxygen. All right, shaving our people. You're going to shave men and women. So women get facial hair as we get older because of the lack of hormones or the increase in testosterone. So it's your responsibility to help people with their shaving. The reason that we put on shaving cream and aftershave cream is to help prevent skin irritation. Nobody wants to be shaved with a dry razor. And it's just like shaving yourself. You get the area warm or wet with a warm, wet washcloth, heat up a washcloth with water on it, stick it on their skin, and then put some shaving cream on there. Hold the skin taut while you are shaving, which means pull down on the skin and keep it tight so that they have a lot of wrinkles or you don't want just to shave off the top parts of their skin. You want to actually hold it tight and then shave in the direction that the beard grows. So on the bottom, you're going to be shaving upwards, but then along the sides, you're going to be shaving like towards the center of their mustache. And then on their face, you're going to be going down. Okay. So shave in short strokes, rinse the shaver out in between each stroke and then go on to another stroke, just like you do yourself. Avoid moles, rashes, cuts. If you happen to nick the person, put a piece of paper towel on there or toilet paper, just like you do yourself and let the nurse know. The shavers are disposable. So if they have a disposable shaver, never share razors. Just throw it away in the shark's container. Now, if they have an electronic shaver that they plug in, they don't use shaving cream for that. Those electronic shavers, they just shave it and then they put some aftershave lotion on. So make sure you're using that aftershave lotion to prevent irritation. Okay. Fingernail care. We are going to be soaking the resident's hand in a basin of soapy water for at least five to 10 minutes. It is your responsibility to keep the fingernails clean and dry and keep stuff from getting up underneath them or keep them clean where they're not having like food or feces or dead cells from scratching on themselves underneath their fingernails. So fingernails are important. Some facilities let you cut fingernails, some facilities don't. So it's according to facility policy, but everybody should be washing and cleaning fingernails. Some places let you use an orange wood stick, which are these little sticks with a flat tip on the end that you can dig the dirt out from underneath their nails. 
Just be careful that you're not stabbing them or poking them too deeply with it. So what we're doing is soaking their hand in a basin of warm, soapy water. That's the only time you're allowed to put soap in the basin. If you have filled that basin up with warm, soapy water and let their hands soak for five to 10 minutes, then you're gonna take it and dump it out and put clean water back in your basin. Still less than 106 degrees, comfortable for the resident to be able to soak their hand in the basin of water. Clean under their nails with your orange wood stick, inspect the nails, push back the cuticles with your washcloth, and then use a file as necessary, okay? You can apply lotion to their hand, but you're only gonna cut their fingernails if your facility allows. If you are cutting fingernails, you just cut it straight across. You take the clipper and cut it straight across. You leave it hanging off a little bit over top of the tip of the finger. If you cut it too short, then it's going to make an ingrown fingernail. Okay. So if you are cutting it with a clipper straight across, then you're going to use the file just to file down the edges, and then you're done. You've used the orange wood stick or something to get up underneath the nail to get off all the dirt from it, and you've used a washcloth or something to push back on the cuticles, and the fingernails look presentable. So there are some places that let you paint fingernails. There's also a lot of facilities that they have volunteers come in once a week and paint their fingernails. But you need to make sure those nails are clean up underneath the nail. Okay. Foot care. Some residents, some places let CNAs do foot care as well, but most places would prefer for a podiatrist to cut their toenails. So. You can still do foot care and clean the person's feet. We're going to work on doing that. We're going to do hand care and nail care and foot care. But you need to make sure that if your resident needs specific foot care, if they have a corn or a callus or an ingrown toenail or their toenails are just really, really long with fungus growing all over them, you let the nurse know so that we can put them on the list for the podiatrist. Just like the dentist, the podiatrist comes once a month, but we have to know who needs to be seen by the podiatrist. Okay, you are, you're not responsible for cutting their nails, especially if they're a diabetic person, but you are responsible for letting us know that they need their nails cut so we can tell the podiatrist. For nails, for foot care, we're gonna work on this, but you need to soak their feet for at least 15 to 20 minutes. You can soak it in just warm water, or you can put a little bit of soap in the water, but then you're going to rinse out the basin. You're always supporting the foot and the ankle when you're washing their feet, so don't just let them dangle in midair. You're holding on to their ankle when you're washing their foot. And you're going to wash it and dry it completely, especially in between the toes. So you have to separate each toe and specifically go with a different part of the washcloth in between each toe. You're going to wash it, then you're going to rinse it, and then you're going to dry it. If you don't dry between each toe, they're going to start getting some fungus growing in between where it's still moist in between their toes. So some kind of bacteria or fungus or foot rot is going to grow. This is an example of a diabetic person's foot who had to have their toe amputated. So when people have diabetes, they have poor circulation to their feet, they may have an injury to their foot that they don't know, and then eventually it doesn't heal, it turns into a, a sore or it needs to be amputated. So definitely if you have a diabetic person, you never cut their toenails, but you are supposed to be cleaning their feet. So clean their feet, inspect their feet every time it's bath day or every day. And whatever your facility policy is on cleaning and doing foot care, but you should help your residents keep up with their foot care because a lot of times they do have some neuropathy where they can't feel their feet. They may have stepped on a tack or stepped on a nail and don't even know that it's in there. But as your responsibility for toenail foot care, cleaning under the nails, again with the orange wood stick if your facility allows, inspect the feet and nails for redness, for sores, for skin breakdown. When you get that resident back in the bed for to lay down for a nap or to go down for the night, you take off their shoes and you take off their socks, look at the bottom of their feet and make sure their feet look okay. Wear gloves whenever you're doing foot care because they could have some fungus or something growing on their foot. 
but you are never going to remove a corn or a callus, and you're never going to put lotion in between their toes. Um, when you're putting lotion on their feet, you're just warming it up in your hands and with gloved hands on and just rubbing it across the top and the bottom of their foot. But do not separate the toes and put lotion in between the toes because that's going to make it moist and make it more a better area for fungus and bacteria to grow in between their toes. In between their toes should be dried with the towel and then don't put lotion. So we're going to watch and we're going to do foot care on each other. Uh, dressing and undressing your resident. So always close the door, pull the privacy curtain, and ask the resident what they would like to wear. Offer them choices. Even if they're blind, you still ask them what they would like to wear today. What color would they like to wear? Give them two choices. Do you want to wear pink or black today? Tell them what the weather is outside. It's nice and warm today. It's going to be hot in the 80s. So dress them in age-appropriate, season-appropriate clothing. Okay. If you are dressing someone who has a weak side, you are always going to dress the weak side first or the affected arm first. If you are undressing a person with a weak side, you undress the affected arm first last. So you kind of have to get that in your head the right way. But we're going to practice putting on a shirt for each other and we're going to pretend that we have a weak right arm. So when we're taking our shirt off, we're going to take off the left arm first and then take off the right arm last. Then we're going to hold up a bath blanket to cover the person while we're putting the other shirt on. But we're going to put on the right arm first and then the left arm last. Um, that way they can help you with that left arm moving it around because it's the unaffected arm. Now, if you need to put on a shirt for someone who doesn't have buttons down the front of the shirt, you put their head in first, and then you do the weak arm first. So put the head in first through the hole, just like you're dressing your baby. You put the head on, and then you stick one arm through, and then stick the other arm through. It's just that you stick the head on and stick the weak side in first when you're dressing them. Encourage independence. Make sure that they can do as much as they can to dress themselves. If they can't dress themselves, you're just going to roll them from side to side in the bed and do the best you can to pull up their clothing for them. Okay? So if they're laying down, you're still going to have to put pants on them. You need to take off the old pants, roll them from side to side as you wiggle the pants down to the end of their feet, cover them with a bath blanket, get the pants off, and then get new pants back on. If they can lift their hips up off the bed, then that'll help you a little bit more. But always encourage independence, encourage them to do as much as they can for themselves, to dress themselves, and give them options on what they're going to be wearing. Um, so we're going to watch the video about me helping someone get dressed with a weak right arm. So bathing, personal hygiene, dressing, mouth care, denture care, shampooing, combing, all of the grooming is the CNA's responsibility. People need to look presentable when they come out into the public, when they leave their room and come out into the hallway or go for breakfast or go for lunch, make sure they look decent. Um, help them wash their face. Some people still like to put on makeup. You can help them with their makeup. Some people have makeup remover that they like to remove their makeup with. So whatever they want to do to make themselves look presentable to come out to have some dignity, you're going to help them with that. But you're definitely going to be encouraging mouth care. And also shaving. A lot of times people neglect to shave themselves or it'll be a couple days before the man wants to shave his beard. But just encourage them, let them know we have razors available, we have shaving cream. They can sometimes still shave themselves. They just don't have access to a razor. And then we need to let them know that we will get that for them. But if you have any questions about bathing, personal care, personal hygiene, we'll go over that and then we will work on all of the different skills together.